Deputy Chancellor. After the classic doorstep departure right shot, here. Right on, please, sir. Right on. the Chancellor went back inside. He emerged from the boss's door. The two have been wrestling over this budget as the economic numbers continued to tighten and the options were squeezed. But there was enough for this. From April the 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year. The Prime Minister rushed out a campaign video explainer of his own. Ultimately, I'd like to end the unfairness where people in work are paying tax twice on those earnings. Stick with me, Rishi Sunak was saying, and the long-term goal could be to abolish national insurance altogether. If they've grabbed that as a battle cry to calm down backbenchers who wanted big income tax cuts, maybe not the right thing to grab. I would be cautious about that because there is an important contributory principle and I think there are some very good reasons for maintaining uh, that contributory principle. So I think um, reducing it, yes. Abolishing it altogether, I'd be a little bit more cautious. He, like other chancellors, posed for pre-budget pictures hard at work. Tellingly, this year, there was a presence at the chancellor's shoulder. The prime minister co-authoring traps for Labour in an election year including the theft of their planned abolition of non-DOM tax status. The government will abolish the current tax system for non-DOMs, get rid of the outdated concept of domicile. Labour cheered the Tories for stealing their policy, but they now have to find another revenue raiser. I aim to please all sides of the House in all my budgets. Tory MPs sat in silence. Maybe they still believed what they'd long been told by their own leaders. Even though, um, you know, it gives easy shots to opposition parties, I think it would be the wrong thing to do. It would end up costing Britain money. The Chancellor began the day with a lengthy run. Later in the Commons, he repeatedly emphasised he was lowering taxes. But the Office for Budget Responsibility report showed the pre-budget path of the tax take as a percentage of GDP, destined to go to historic levels. The Chancellor's brand new post-budget graph line shows it just a bit lower, still going up and going up to record levels. Taxes clearly have still risen a lot, uh, particularly as a fraction of national income. And for lower earners and much higher earners, taxes are still considerably higher. For companies and so on, they're higher. So th this did cut taxes, but over the parliament as a whole, clearly a tax rising parliament. Yeah, I mean, the big picture about Britain rather than about what's happening in Westminster is completely unchanged from today. We're a country that is seeing taxes going up, not coming down, and a country that is struggling to grow with incomes going into the next election the same level they were when we went into the last one in 2019. Today, a new entry in this hall of infamy, the Chancellor, who breezes into this chamber in a recession and tells the working people of this country that everything's on track. Crisis? What crisis? So we say to the Chancellor Prime Minister, it's time to break the habit of 14 years, stop the dithering, stop the delay, stop the uncertainty, and confirm May the 2nd as the date of the yeah. next general election, because Britain deserves better and Labour are ready. Yeah. Did you catch any of Jeremy's budget? Yeah. No, you're all working too hard. This afternoon, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister found their much-leaked budget hadn't reached these voters. Some Tory MPs grumbled the government had grabbed the wrong tax cut to bring back lost electoral support. If I had had my way, I would not have gone for national insurance, I would have gone for reducing income tax. My preference would have been a 2p cut off the basic rate of income tax and an increase in the personal allowance and a raising of the ta income tax thresholds. <laughs> they felt the scope for cutting taxes was just too tight for that. They want to win back the mantle of tax cutting, but their offer today was smaller than they would have liked. And polls suggest they have many votes to shift. And Gary's with me now. So if it's a tax-cutting budget, but the burden's going up, 
Who are the winners and losers? Well, it's really important to remember the last fiscal event wasn't very long ago. The, amongst the losers are the people who are dependent on the uh, bits of the public sector that have unprotected budgets because a lot of these numbers, like the numbers in the autumn statement, rest on uh, some public spending projections which are very, very tight. Now, the Treasury let it be known uh, beforehand, uh, who knows for, with what motive, that they might have to cut that and didn't, to, maybe to try and make it all seem a bit more comfortable. But the head of the OBR not so long ago said that these were extremely tight settlements and it would be flattering to call them a work of fiction because fiction gets written down. So uh, they st those those people uh, are, are losers still because nothing is, uh, there's been no relaxation of those totals. Pensioners are losers, often sort of lavished with gifts and loved by Tory chancellors, get nothing out of this package. The main gainers seem to be employees on about 50,000 a year. As for what all this means uh, politically and in terms of an early election, as you were talking about a, a second ago, it just... It, it doesn't feel like a big bazooka moment. If, uh, if, if the Chancellor had been able to go for income tax as well, uh, as well as uh, uh, national insurance and as well as stealing Labour's policies, you might have thought that was in play. But in an interview this, uh, this evening, uh, the Chancellor has said the working assumption uh, is still that we have another fiscal event before an autumn uh, election. So you've got to expect that is probably where we're heading. One of the things that was weighing in the scales in terms of an early election was could Rishi Sunak actually get there as leader of his party? Could Tory wars bring him down? I would say this has not done enough to uh, calm down the people who are determined to bring him down and wanted a mega tax cuts. Neither has it inflamed them. They lurk. They will continue to plot. And one of the questions will be whether this budget has anything, any impact at all on the set of local elections we're uh, heading for, the next big uh, political milestone. And you've got to wonder, after the last 2 big cut, it might not. Thanks, Gary. Well, I've been speaking to the Conservative MP Bim Afalami, who's the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, and I put it to him that the tax burden is still going up to historic highs. It's not tax raising because we. this is a tax cutting budget. And let me explain what that means in real numbers. So if you take the autumn statement and the spring budget this year, so those two together, we've cut national insurance by a third. Yeah. To your average, for your average worker, that's 900 pounds. But the tax burden's going up, isn't it? Well, the tax burden overall, yes. as a result of the last four fiscal events since this chance has been in place, has actually reduced by 0.6%, right? So we are doing everything we can. But look, but the reason why the tax burden rose... But since the last election, it's, it's gone up, right. hasn't it? And it's still projected since, to okay. still go up. Since the last election, there are a couple of things that happened. One was the COVID, it, uh, COVID pandemic. The other was Putin's illegal war in the Ukraine. We spent over £400 yeah. billion pounds on that. But the difference between us and the opposition is we've got a credible path that we're already delivering on, delivering on to bring taxes down. But the truth is, the tax burden is going up, has gone up, and it's still going up. Yes, and we're bringing so, it down. So, so you may be reducing some taxes, no, but, we're, we're but overall down. they're going up. No, no, but we are bringing it down, and we, there are specific people different groups that are getting real benefit. Let yeah. me give you another group. So I talked about average work on national If you earn about £35,000 a year, yes. the, the net result of fiscal drag and the national insurance cut is what? It's a few hundred pounds, isn't it? Right. Well, let me give you... It's less I, than 500. I, I, well, I, I, yes, but that's... Well, hold on, but that's still quite a lot of money to a lot of people, and I don't think we should sniff at that. What if you earn 25,000? Well, well, hold on. Well, if you talk about... Let me take about somebody on the national 25, living wage. 25,000, you get nothing, let me, do you? Let me you? talk about somebody on the national living wage, right? So people... Well, just answer that question. End, well, no, I don't... I don't at at know 35, it's numbers. about 500 pounds. At 25, it's nothing. Christian, I don't know the precise numbers for every single income bracket. What I can tell you is the child benefit changes today mean that a couple, for example, on £60,000 and £35,000, not wealthy by any means, because of the changes of moving the child benefit threshold from £50,000 to £6,000, if you take into account their national insurance cuts, they'll be almost £5,000 better off. Isn't it very cynical and easy to see through when you take two of Labour's plans, particularly the non-DOM idea, or scrapping non-DOM stasis, which up until this budget you said was the wrong idea. You know, won't voters look at that and just go, you're just playing petty politics here? Honestly, that isn't what happened. The, you just changed your well, mind? No, well, let me explain what happened. 
The, the policy on non-DOMS has been discussed in the Treasury for many months. We were concerned that the way Labour were planning to do it was going to be anti-competitive and would lead to um, a huge exodus of people to come to this country who we need. We're putting in place a system that will ensure that we, yes, get people to come here, but when they come here after four years to pay their fair share of tax, and critically, yes, it does raise money. We're not just doing it for ideological reasons. Yeah. It does raise money. It raises about You said it was points. the wrong thing, and now points. you're doing it. But anyway, let's move on to spending plans. As we just heard, um, there are massive spending cuts for unprotected departments uh, as a result of your budget after 2025. Why won't you be honest with people about that? There are not. And what we've committed to in cash terms is that 1% increase yeah. for uh, across, Overall. across public services. But you've guaranteed yes, more course. than that to some departments, and that means that others will have to have cuts. Well, not necessarily, because in that period of time, then future parliaments will make their own decisions about exactly how to allocate the money. The important thing here is that we're increasing spending on our public services. So you at might the change all time, of this, is what you mean? Well, well of course, so you might cut always, the NHS. No, things or... are always subject to change, as everybody watching this knows. Well, I mean, I'm trying to work out what the result is. There's of no a... point me saying to you that nothing can ever change in politics over the next five years, right? That wouldn't be credible. At so, all. why did the Chancellor call these permanent tax cuts? They're not permanent, are they? They are permanent because we are committed. <laughs> but, but you just said everything changes. No, Christian, let me be clear. What we've said is we've committed to some things like the tax cuts we've said. We've absolutely committed to them. What I'm saying is the broader macroeconomic climate, of course, could potentially change in five years' time if we're talking about the spending allocation going to a particular department, right? So the point I'm trying to make to you is that in addition to ensuring rises in spending for the public services, we're also investing in improving the productivity. What I mean by productivity is showing we get more bobbies on the peat, making sure we get more teachers in our schools and more nurses in hospital. Ben Mafalami, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, closely watching the budget was the Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, whose job just became a bit harder if Labour wins the next election, as widely expected. I interviewed her a little while ago, and I began by asking her, with some of the Chancellor's budget looking not unlike Labour's ideas, how is her party going to pay for its plans now? So it is a real utter humiliation for the government that today in their final budget of this parliament, they came for the non-DOM policy, which I've been going on about for ages. If you make Britain your home, you should pay your taxes here. I'm glad today that the Chancellor finally uh, came round to agree with that. But given that they've been uh, decrying the policy for the last few years, it is a humiliation for them. Now, you're right to say that we uh, were going to use that money to uh, reduce hospital waiting lists, have extra emergency dental appointments and free breakfast clubs at primary schools. Um, we will now go away and make sure that we can find that money uh, elsewhere. It's not going to be easy. There's not a magic money tree, but I will go through every pound of government expenditure and make sure we find that money. I will do that in an orderly way and I'll do it in a fiscally responsible way. So you'll have to way. think of another tax raising measure or a spending cut? Well, we're going to go through. The government published today their latest uh, forecasts and their uh, spending trajectories. We'll go through every pound of money, but if we can identify waste or uh, expenditure that we wouldn't make, we will use that for this priority, because cutting waiting lists is a national priority, it's a Labour priority, and we will find that money. But he, he has set the trap for you, hasn't he? And he repeated it over and over again that Labour will put up taxes, and the truth is you'll have to. Well, look, we have said that there will be some targeted tax increases. Uh, the tax loophole whereby private schools don't pay VAT and business rates, that will go. The tax loophole whereby private equity managers don't pay uh, income tax on their bonuses, uh, that will go. And similarly, we will have a proper windfall tax on the big profits that the energy Even giants Even more than he's announced today. Yes, because we'd close the loopholes. There are some energy companies making big profits, but they don't pay any of the energy profits levy. So we would close that loophole uh, as well. So there'll be some targeted tax increases to put an immediate injection of cash into public services, but then we have to grow the economy. And what the Conservatives have failed to do, our economy is now in recession, what the Conservatives have failed to do these last 14 years is to grow the economy. We have a comprehensive plan to do just that, and in the end, that's the only way to invest sustainably in our public services. But what, why are you going along with both their tax cuts and their rules, which mean that after 2025 at the moment, some departments, the ones that aren't protected, are looking at massive cuts. 
Well, of course, that's based on the government's uh, uh, forecast and their policies. We have a plan for growth that will lift those uh, growth trajectories, which means that we will have more money. But look, I'm under no yeah, illusions. This is 2025. I mean, you're not going to grow the economy that quick. Look, I'm under no illusions, Krishnan, about the scale of the challenge that an incoming Labour government will inherit. It will be the worst inheritance of any government since the Second World War. So there will be cuts, won't there, for some departments? Well, look, we will set out those plans. At the moment, uh, the, spending, uh, the spending goes up by 1% a year in real terms. Average. But, but, but some departments are getting more than that and that means that some will have well, to get less. We will, we will set that all out. We will do a spending review when we come into government because of course the government haven't done uh, a spending uh, review. But I'm not under any illusions about the scale of the challenge. The challenge will be enormous. We could be looking at an election in May. I mean, bring it on. You, you, bring it on. You've only got a couple of weeks to come up with these ideas. No, we'll do, a spending, Krishna, we'll do a spending review in government. Uh, this government haven't done a spending review for a number of years now. We will open the books and we will do that uh, spending so review. So you'll go into an election saying to people, we don't know whether some departments are going to have to have cuts? Well, look, at the moment, the spending trajectory hasn't changed today compared to where it was in November. There are real terms increases in government spending, but the government haven't said how that money is going to be allocated across departments. We'd have to do that in government. That's not something you can do from opposition. But we will uh, inject money immediately in public services uh, through closing those tax loopholes on private schools, on private equity, and the windfall tax on the uh, um, big energy companies. That will put money straight away into our public services. Services, but then we have to grow the economy because there is no shortcut to more money. We have to grow the economy if we're going to properly fund public services. But do you think this is really honest with people? You know, isn't there a sort of a there's a sort of a dance that goes on around now where you say, in order to look credible, I will stick to Tory spending envelopes. Um, but nobody believes that if the Tories were to be re-elected, they would stick to those numbers. You know, because because they involve cuts. <laughs> And so, you know, your, your plan to say I'll stick to those numbers aren't any more credible. No, but Krishnan, I'm saying there will be an immediate injection of cash into public services because we will close those tax loopholes that we have identified. And that will mean for our schools and the hospitals, there will be more money. Rachel Reese, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, now to dig deeper into all of those budget numbers, here in Leeds, our economics correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, has been running the slide rule over all the numbers. So, Helia, what's caught your eye? Well, Cathy, the Chancellor is very keen to present this budget as a turning point, a turning point on growth, on inflation, and most importantly of all, on taxation. But the figures tell a different story. If we look at headroom, for example, let's go back to March last year. The government had headroom of £6.5 billion. That's the smallest on record. In November, the numbers looked a bit rosier, up to £31 billion, but they spent £18 billion, leaving them with £13 billion of headroom. Today, the headroom was much the same, £12 billion, but the Chancellor spent some on tax giveaways, giving him a margin of error of just £9 billion. Now, that kind of headroom is tiny in the context of a £2.8 trillion economy. So where's the money for today's tax cuts coming from, Helia? Well, there's more cash, Cathy, because the growth forecasts look better. Now, part of that is because inflation is coming down a lot faster than people expected. But part of it is to do with population expansion. That's something the government is less keen to talk about. We know the participation rate, that's how much people work, has fallen dramatically since the pandemic. That's one of the big problems of the economy. But today, the OBR said the picture was looking even worse. Now, what's saving us from this grim picture is that there's more people. And this is largely thanks to migration. We thought net migration would be about 245,000. Today, that number's gone up to 315,000. And the OVR were very keen to make clear that migrants bring in £6.5 billion a year in taxation alone, adding significantly to the boost into the economy. Now, one of the big questions from today's budget is all about the Chancellor's claims on tax cuts. There's been £29 billion of tax cuts since 2020. That's great. It's helped mostly by the national insurance cuts that we've seen today and those from last year. But it also includes a bunch of corporate tax breaks. But if you dig a little bit further into how much taxes have gone up, 
the Chancellor's claims start to look a bit hollow because double the tax cuts are the tax increases. In fact, £62 billion worth. £21 billion was levelled at companies and £41 billion is from freezing tax thresholds. That's the dreaded fiscal drag. It means 3.7 million more people have been dragged into paying income tax. And the IFS says this will mean we end up with the biggest tax raising parliament ever. And despite today's cuts, we'll have a tax burden of 37% of GDP. That's just a tenth of a percent lower than the record year all the way back in 1948. Well, Helia, there are always winners and losers in any budget. So who are they today? Well, Cathy, let's take a look at this chart from the Resolution Foundation. You can see that if you earn less than £20,000, well, you're out of pocket. But if you earn anything from £26,000 to £60,000, then you're quits in. Above that, you're losing out again. And all of that is because the Chancellor hopes this will appeal to key voters in the middle. And to end on a positive note, after years of high inflation and a pandemic, the OBR now says real incomes will get to a pre-pandemic levels two years earlier. The problem, Cathy, is that much, people at home will say that may be turning a corner, but it's not turning that corner fast enough. Helia, thanks very much. Chris, back to you in Westminster. Thank you. Well, Richard Hughes is chairman of the Office for Budget Responsibility, which assesses the health of the UK's economy and whose forecasts determine how much the Chancellor has to spend in the budget. There was some noise from protesters when I interviewed him a little earlier. I began by asking him if this is a tax-cutting budget or a tax-raising one. Uh, so the, the Chancellor is cutting taxes in this budget. Uh, you know, he's cut another 2p off, the nat off national insurance on top of the 2p cut back in November. But overall, all the tax policies the government's introduced since the pandemic are actually raising the tax burden. It's already gone up by about 3% of GDP. It goes up by another 1% of GDP in our forecast based on the policies that they've set. So it takes, it takes some of that tax burden off. But over the five years of our forecast, we've got another 1% rise in the tax burden up to what is a post-war high of around 37% of GDP by the time we get to the end of it. The other thing the Chancellor claimed was that um, debt is falling according to the government's rules. Is debt falling right now? It's not falling right now, but by the time we get to the end of the forecast period, it falls by a, a relatively small amount, just £9 billion by the fifth year of our forecast. But between now and 2028-29, and it's not actually falling. Is it? So the accurate thing to say is it is forecast to fall in a few years' time. So it's forecast it's currently to fall falling. in five years' time, which is the yeah. Chancellor's target. And, but, but he gives himself four years to get there and, and is taking the policies he needs to, to do that. You note in your report that immigration is up. So how important is that number of immigrants to your assumptions about uh, growth? So we have been surprised on the upside by the, level of, by the level of net migration. It's one of the things which pushes up on output in our forecast over the next five years. What we've also seen is disappointing news on the number of people working in the British economy. And that offsets that, that rise in the workforce from higher migration, enough to mean that output doesn't really change compared to our November forecast. So, so does that mean that immigrants are effectively replacing the growth that people in the uh, sort of indigenous population aren't producing because they're not working? Uh, I, I wouldn't think of it that way. I mean, what it, what it means is that what, you've got more people coming to the country. In general, they're of working age, so they tend to join the labour force with roughly the same participation rate as the domestic population. But we've also seen, like a lot of other countries, a worrying rise in levels of inactivity after the pandemic. And so that's one of the things which offsets what would be an overall rise in the population had you not had, you not had that. Now, earlier in the year, um, you, you said that the government's spending plans after 2025, um, well, were effectively worse than a work of fiction. Uh, because at least the work of fiction is written. Is that still the case? So it's still the case that there is a lack of detail about the government's departmental spending plans beyond March of next year. They haven't done other spending review, and so beyond March of next year, we just have an overall number for the level of current spending and the level of capital spending. We don't know how the government makes its spending plans add up beyond the end of the current spending review period. And that's four out of five years of a forecast, which, which the Chancellor relies on to say that debt's falling. In so we are looking at big cuts in some departments. So out over the next five years, there is no real per person growth in spending on public services. And the government's got commitments to grow spending by more than that in areas like health, in areas like education, in areas like defence. And so that does mean you've got to see real terms cuts somewhere else in order to stay within that overall envelope that's not growing in real per person terms. And, and that, that's the challenge facing whoever's in government. 
It is. After 2025. It is. It'll be the challenge of waiting uh, the chance that when, they, when they're doing their next funding review. Richard Hughes, thank you very much. Thank you. So how is this budget going down with people around Britain? Paul McNamara watched Jeremy Hunt's speech with a group in Bournemouth, part of the so-called blue wall of conservative seats in southern England under threat. A budget that needed to draw a line in the sand. Convince a nation that things are getting better. Conservatives know lower taxes mean higher growth. <laughs> The first announcement that caught our panel in Bournemouth's eye. I've decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. A freeze, but not a cut to levels in Germany, for example, says Chris, who owns 22 bars. He's just frozen He's rates on, on, on booze there. That's quite healthy. It's massively excessive to, to comparable countries. We're supposed to be competitive. And it just, it's, so it's disingenuous, we lost over 500 pubs last year. It was on savings, though, we saw the first dividing line between the generations. I will introduce a brand new British ISA, which will allow an additional £5,000 annual investment. You're talking about the average person, they might not have savings, so for them it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. What about yourself? It does for me, I think, because obviously I'm coming towards my pension, yes. so my husband and I are lucky enough to have some savings. So for us, that's a benefit. Anything that helps, any extra savings right now. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so he's done you a turn? Though. He's done me a turn, yeah. <laughs> In seaside towns like Bournemouth, property comes at a premium. Locals priced out by investors buying holiday lets. Today, tax breaks for those second homeowners were scrapped. In this area of Bournemouth, uh, I can think of at least off the top of my head 20 to 30 properties within a four minute walk that are holiday let properties. When you have younger people coming in mm. to your office looking to buy property, mm. how tough is it for them? Uh, it's extremely tough, um, particularly with the way that rents are at the moment for uh, a, a young family trying to save for a deposit, it can be extremely difficult. And so for them to find somewhere uh, in the current climate is near on impossible. Do you think what you've just heard from the Chancellor will make it any easier for those young families to find properties, to find deposits? In theory, yes. Next I turn to the taxes paid by those who are resident in the UK, but not domiciled here. This was an announcement that didn't just meet with the odd smile in Parliament. All right, when, you think of not, when you're looking at that picture there and you hear him talking about non-doms, what do you think of? <laughs> Rishi Sunak's wife. OK. <laughs> I mean, you just... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think they've nicked uh, Starmer's lunch here, really, haven't they? I think it's with this one. The Prime Minister's wife, Akshata Murthy, has in the past claimed non-domicile tax status. That's no longer the case. Abolishing it, though, was Labour's plan to fund the NHS. What's your Labour policy? That was Labour's poli oh. that was Labour policy and he's just nicked it. How do you feel about that? I'm not too sure about it. He might just be stealing <laughs> ideas from the other side now. <laughs> do you care about if he steals ideas as long as the ideas work? As long as he implements them, I think it's fine. Employee national insurance will be cut by another 2p from 10% to 8%. This was the headline announcement and one welcomed by a boss who thinks his punters will have more to spend and his staff higher wages. If it's going to put more money in people's pockets, that's great news um, for the consumer. What's going to be the impact on... Well, that's, that's what, he, that's what absolutely, you want to hear, right? Yeah, yeah, well, it's great. I mean, at the end of the day, we want our employees to earn as much as, as they can, and that, coupled with the increase in national minimum wage, is great news for our employees. So what, he's, so what the Chancellor's just done there, does that mean Abdul's going to get more money absolutely, in his Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there will be more money, and that, that will be coupled with the increase in national minimum wage. There you go, you've got that from the Chancellor and your boss. <laughs> <laughs> the verdict from our panel in a town that has only ever elected Tories warmer than before the Chancellor started speaking, but no one resoundingly won over. Here at least, it looks like this budget is yet to turn the tide of opinion significantly for the government. Paul McNamara in sunny Bournemouth. Now over to Cathy in Leeds. Thanks, Krish. Well, today the Chancellor also promised to make good an announcement from last year's budget, more free early years childcare. Working parents of two-year-olds will be able to claim 15 hours a week from next month. But was the extra £500 million to help providers with staffing costs enough to enable nurseries, childminders and daycare centres to cope with demand? 
I'm joined by the Policy Director of the National Day Nurseries Association, Jonathan Broadbury. So was this anything more than a kind of rather sizeable sticking plaster? Well, I think what we've got from today's announcement is actually a bit more of a plan for the future. So what the Chancellor has announced is that funding in the future will uh, do what we've been asking to do, which is taking account of inflation, taking account of rising staffing costs, which is helping providers to combat rising costs by making sure that the funding is in line with that. So what we want to see is that that is the plan going forward because we've got into a situation where funding hasn't kept pace with those rising costs. Right, so with this funding that's been announced today, will parents still be facing higher fees, do you think? I mean, will the free childcare offer, in inverted commas, that they've been given actually in some cases not leave them much better off? Well, the free offer isn't fully free. Um, you know, pr uh, it covers part of the costs mm -hmm. of childcare for pro providers. So many parents will uh, find that um, a childcare provider, whatever type they are, has to say for the consumables and extra uh, elements, there are charges involved. Mm -hmm. What we know from our members is they're actually working really hard to keep costs down for parents. So while they face rising staffing costs of about 14%, um, they're keeping fees to an average of about an 8.5% increase. So the announcement... It's still a big increase. It, I mean, childcare is still pretty unaffordable, particularly for low-income families. Yeah, we know that it's one of the major costs that, that parents and families face. Um, and, you know, the reality of it is that comes from uh, staffing costs, which is over three quarters of the operating costs for most nurseries. So, um, you know, that's, the, that's paying the wages of the people who are providing the care and the early education to, to those children. So it can't be done um, on the cheap. When you look at the fact this extra cash was provided with less than a month before the first phase of the free childcare for two-year-olds was going to be rolled out. You, it, you kind of draw the conclusion that it wasn't really a very well thought out policy, don't you? Well, what we've got here is a plan for from next April. So not this April coming. The, uh, the funding that was announced today was for April 2025. We really hope that there was going to be some help for providers now because we know that 73% um, of providers are operating at a loss or just breaking even. Um, we know that uh, nursery closures increased at their fastest rate uh, last year. So providers do need help now. Uh, we wanted to see something on the three and four year old funding rate, which is the real pinch point, um, and maybe something on business rates where the Chancellor was able to give support to pubs and to film studios, but not for childcare settings. Mm. Uh, well, and you know, the, there have been quite a few childcare providers go bust and go out of business. That's still a lot of, there's a risk around that, isn't there still? Yes, there's, there still is a risk, and unfortunately, we're still seeing them, um, you know, as recently as, as yesterday being announced. So it is a very real proposition, and, um, you know, what we're saying is this is a good uh, long term step from the government. We want to see them listening more to the uh, concerns of the sector. Uh, there's some things that could have been done uh, with a stroke of the pen the Chancellor hasn't done today, but, you know, there's, there's hope there. Well, do you know any more about Labour's pledge? Is that well funded? Is it well thought out? Or do we not know the details of what it is yet? Well, what we know from Labour is that they're, um, they're going through a, a policy review on this um, so that they're looking at what it is that they would offer to families and how they would work with providers to, to come up with a plan. We don't know the details of that plan and, and it would be really important to see those. Um, mm. But we know that that's under review at the moment. Right, but they haven't given you a sneak preview. Jonathan Broadbury, thanks very much. Thank